The most beautiful thing in the world is not a freshly cut scented rose. It's not a sunny day, blue skies with scattered white clouds, nor is it any piece of art by Da Vinci, Michelangelo, or Picasso. The most beautiful thing is the glow of a woman who has life inside of her life. The most beautiful thing is the shape of a woman who carries the product of her own creation. The most beautiful thing is the mere fact that she is now two and one, turning two into three. The most beautiful thing in the world is pregnancy, two and one. Now, her attitude might change at the snap of a finger from laughing about something to crying about nothing to mad about everything and jumping on your every word. And midnight hugs might have to be put on hold for a minute, but you have to understand those nights when she doesn't feel like it to control those manly nerves. And her taste buds might crave a specific flavor at that specific time to calm her motherly appetite urge. And she's always a topic of attention wherever she goes. For she carries around her own nest for 270 days, protective like a mother bird. Two and one. And fellas, we must understand the mental, chemical, and physical imbalances that plague her, spoil her, and give her respect. For she is the one who protects it which you help create, massage her stress, lower back, relax her muscles to help her stand straight, rub her sore and tired feet for all day she carries around this extra weight. Two and one. Brothers, we must not only be the role of the father, but the role of the coach and guardian of her temple. We must protect her from harm, not create harm. We must channel all stress the way that tries to tire her womb, not cause stress. We, might, we must make sure she eats right, exercises, and gives her rest for the long haul. We, might, we must make her out of being peaceful for her and being a change and easy to break like a glass wall. Two and one. Men, we must understand that when her water breaks, she's now putting her life on the line to give birth, not you. She's now sacrificing her life so that another life may live, not you. She is now fighting unbearable pains and defeating complications so that you and her may live on through a new life, not you. I tear for the women whose last push was their last breath. Two and one. A magazine said, on an average, a man says this woman is beautiful five times a month. But ladies who've had babies, you remember when your ankles and feet started to swell. The marks began to stretch, your face started to puff, your nose began to spread, your hair gets longer, and the daily outfits are stretch pants and t-shirts. If it was God's plan and I was your man, I'll tell you, baby, you look good five times a day. And I mean it each time because you're more beautiful than this universe. You are the universe in and around you. My sun rays, joining with the moonlight, creating and developing a shining star. I've seen a lot of beautiful things in my life, some desirable, some unforgettable, and some that brought nothing but fun. But there's nothing, nothing more beautiful than a pregnant woman, two and one. Thank you for listening, y'all. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Um, my name is Eric Smith. Poetically, I go by eBaby. Um, I'm not going to tell you that because I don't know you all. And uh, yeah, it's personal, it's personal, but just enjoy the name. Um, I'm here uh, as a poet, and we are doing the first annual LOC Super Panel, Super Users. Uh, we are people who take advantage of the Copyright Office uh, or the CRS Office or COM, those are different divisions within the Library of Congress. And we're just gonna give you a little bit of that right there. Um, just do a bit, a little more uh, poetry real quick. How many people know what a haiku is? Haiku, cool, okay, cool. That's most of the room, so I really don't have to, to go into it. How many people know what a sinru is? Okay, cool, all right. See, it's the same thing as the haiku. <laughs> Haikus are short Japanese poems, as we know, three lines, five, seven, five. They must have a kigo. A kigo means season, so we're talking about summer. Nature, mosquitoes represent summer, the sun, summertime, snow, winter. And they have what's called a koreju, koreju, K-I-R-E-J-U. Look it up if I'm messing it up, I apologize. But that represents how it cuts the sentence off. That's where you get those short sentences. A senru is the exact same thing. Five, seven, five, the only difference is you're allowed to just flow right through it. You don't have to talk about seasons, and it doesn't have to be short, so they can just flow right in and go into it. So I'll do a few. Haiku. And another thing to them is they have to have meaning. So you try to catch what's going on in a short period of time. Haiku. I can say Wednesday, but can't spell Wednesday if I don't say wetness day. Thank you very much, Haiku. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's it. Who was counting just didn't believe me? Like some people. You don't have to raise your hand. I know, I know, I know you. Okay, check it out. 
I can say Wednesday, but can't spell Wednesday if I don't say Wednesday. Five, seven, five. I'll give you another one. Now you believe me, I'll probably get some claps the next time around. <laughs> Just messing with you. All right. Haiku. Some like the person in the selfie more than the one in the mirror. Haiku. Thank you very much. Say haiku. One more. Oh, see? Y'all help me stretch time out. Thank you, thank you. But you don't have to clap anymore. You don't have to clap. One more, one more. Uh, haiku. Some women clip their own wings to stay with the man who's afraid to fly. Haiku, thank you very much. So that's my poetry segment right there. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for listening. Um, I've been doing poetry for about 20 years. And as I travel the country, going to colleges and universities, uh, performing in open mic spots, and I have one here in Hyattsville, Maryland, here in the area, I come across a lot of people who don't copyright their work. They don't copyright their work. Now, that's true that they say, oh, once you've written it, it's done, it's copywritten, but you want to protect yourself. The poor man's copyright, don't do it. Don't mail it to yourself. Don't believe that that mail stamp is protection for you. Do not do that. Copyright.gov is where you need to go. I feel like I'm doing a commercial, you know. <laughs> I do. I, I work at the copyright office. I feel like, you know, I, I hope my boss gets to see this. Hey, I need this on my evaluation, all right? I'm going to need that tape right there, buddy. But um, yes, the Copyright Office, we're here. We are down in southeast DC, uh, right off of the orange and blue line, Capitol Hill. Once you come off of the uh, metro station, we are right there in your face, the Madison Building. There are three buildings to the Library of Congress, and we're in the Madison Building, fourth floor. One thing that's very important, copyright.gov. I'm going to speak to those even who are watching. Copyright dot gov. It's not copyright.com, copyright.net, copyright, this is really us. We've seen it all. There are a lot of uh, organizations out there who will take your money and you will think that you're under copyright law. That is not true. Copyright.gov. C-O-P-Y-R-I-G-H-T. Not W-R-I-T-E. Trust me, I've seen that too. Wrong right. Not that right, this right. Like, make it right. That right. So, um, but definitely protect yourself. It is very important. Um, and that's where you can find us. So today, um, I'm going to bring up a lovely panel and your panel. And as I said, this is a, this is a, a great evening. This is wonderful. We were surprised uh, that the, the crowd that came in. And we thank you. Please give yourselves a round of applause, please, because you, you hung out till 5 o'clock. I know some feet are hurting right now. But enjoy yourselves and relax, and we'll move right on. So. My first presenter, our first panel member, will be the lovely Athena Angelos. Please give it up for her, please. Give it up for Athena. Thank you, love. I'm, I'm kind of nervous. Just get that out of the way. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming this afternoon. And I hope you've been having a, a good day so far at this amazing event. I'd like to thank um, and I'm getting, there we go. So uh, I have to thank Becky Clark of the Publishing Office of the Library of Congress for thinking of me for this event. Um, and like Eric said, it's the first time that they've tried this. I also want to thank Xander Harcourt, the Library Program Coordinator for the National Book Festival. And of course, my fellow super users. I trust that they also had to suffer through jokes about wearing capes all week long. Um, so my name is Athena Angelos, and almost 30 years ago, I would have told you with no uncertainty that I am not a library person. I equated libraries with nothing but books, and to be honest, I'm a painfully slow and pretty distracted reader. Ever since I was a kid, I really preferred well-illustrated books pictures speaking to me more memorably than words on a page. It's no surprise that in college, I majored in fine art with an emphasis on photography. And I, yeah, I related to the, the person on the right in that image there. Fortunately for me, the Library of Congress has a great deal more than books. 
Today I'll explain how I've actually made a living working with a lot of library people, exploring the incredibly rich and well cared for resources. An impressive amount of Library of Congress material has been digitized and is online, but fortunately for me and other professional researchers, there are still vast portions that can only be viewed in person. When I began my career as a picture researcher, I'd never heard of the profession before, but the job description was, do you wanna go find old photos at the Library of Congress? And I couldn't resist that. My first client was a producer of heavily illustrated US history books, sort of like the Time Life series, if some of you remember those. And there's a, that's my shelf at home with some of the books I've worked on over the years. In my first few years, with a lot of help from library staff, I learned how to identify, locate, check copyright when necessary, and order reproductions of images for these series of books. Um, they covered colonial America, the Civil War, the American West, US presidents, and my favorite series, Remarkable Women. In addition to photographs, I learned how to access prints and posters, illustrations and cartoons, architectural drawings, advertisements, and other ephemera. And most of this material that I just showed you is, is from the prints and photographs division alone. So the library has a separate section devoted to prints and photographs. And because letters, diaries, maps, sheet music, newspapers, magazines, film stills, and copyright records all provide wonderful primary source material that can also be used as pictorial matter in articles, books, and documentaries. My research has allowed me to explore other divisions of the library, including um, rare books, geography and maps, manuscripts division, performing arts, motion picture and recorded sound, and of course, the general collections. So I do have to deal with books sometimes. People often ask how potential clients find me. Well, fortunately, the library maintains several lists of freelance researchers. I've also been very lucky, fortunate, to have been hired by the library's own publishing office. Over the years, I've worked with incredibly smart, talented writers and editors to produce the very high caliber of books that one would expect from the Library of Congress. And there's some of the books I worked on. We also did calendars and postcards and knowledge cards. The last book project that I served as researcher and image editor for with the library was an illustrated history of the American experience in World War I entitled America and the Great War by author Peggy Wagner and co-published with Bloomsbury. Working with reference staff, curators, collection specialists, and many others, Peggy and I included over 250 visuals consisting of photographs, lithographs, drawings, maps, posters, advertisements, and even one baseball card. One of the funnest projects I worked on with the library was called Football Nation, 400 Years of America's Game. It was published in 2013 by Abrams. Author Susan Rayburn cheerfully requested that together we simply locate everything in the Library of Congress that related to football. Um, we had a few years, but uh, not that long really. Working from her well-researched and snappy text and many must-have, lists of must-have images, I think the book successfully met the mission of the publishing office, which is to show off with as much variety and novelty the remarkably diverse collections of the library. 
we also just had a lot of fun. And here, here's just a few of my favorites. The variety of clients and of subjects of my research and our ever-changing information technologies have kept me happily engaged with this work. I sometimes describe my job as treasure hunting, and it's incredibly satisfying to help people access these treasures to enrich their creative and scholarly passions. I can't overstate my gratitude and dependence on so many library staff members who for many years have helped me do what I do. I wouldn't be here today as a super user um, without their collections, acumen, support, and friendship. Oh, there's one more football guy. And that's me and the author, Susan Rayburn, goofing around after we finished the book. Last year, I spent several months finding still pictures, mostly of celebrities, to be incorporated in a forthcoming five-part documentary series about the life and times of author, actor, Orson Bean. I'm, I wonder how many of you even remember who Orson Bean was. Yay! Um, he's actually still alive. And um, he, one of the interesting things he did that I hadn't known before is he founded an alternative school for like middle school kids in New York City in the 1960s. And um, some of that story was documented by Look Magazine, which is one of the really wonderful collections in the prints and photographs division. The library has all of the original negatives um, and transparencies from Look Magazine. And a current project that I'm working on is for Ellen Scott, who's a UCLA film professor. She's conducting a really thorough survey of American slavery as it's been depicted in film. Part of my work for Ellen has been to locate over 400 records from microfilm um, of silent era film copyright records. The vast majority of these films no longer exist, but the sometimes very detailed synopses and promotional materials included with the copyright registration files contain a plethora of information for analysis. That's one of the ads that was with the record. Last of all, I want to share this. I was recently talking to a friend, and I was excitedly um, describing my work. And he remarked how nice it was to hear someone speak so proudly about where they work. Um, and he also noted that when I was talking about the collections, I kept saying, we have, we have. Um, and while I've, I've been a contractor at the library off and on for many years, I've, I've never been an official employee. I'm a freelance person. But I was still, I was still you know, bragging about what we have. And while the library exists to serve Congress, it really is our library. And so I hope you've been inspired today and will come and explore what's there for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, next up, Mr. Matthew Gilmore. Please give it up for Mr. Matthew Gilmore, please. The title of mine is Learning to Love the Library of Congress, Making Best Use of Our National Treasure. So there's, a, there's some ideas kind of buried in that title, which we can think about and talk about. Um, if I move it. Okay, how I started to learn to love the library. Um, 
I was a librarian years ago, a different library, the public library, and I was really devoted to that job. So I didn't do research out on my own. I did research for people, helping them, helping them. but I didn't do research independently of that, really. Um, but then I left that library and went in Elson career. And so a few years ago, I began write, writing a monthly column on Washington, D.C. history uh, for a little newspaper called The In-Town, or it's online. And um, so originally, I thought, hey, I can do this through online sources. Every, so much is online now. Google's online. There's lots of books online. That'll, that'll really suffice. Um, I was writing, I think, like 2,000 words. So sizable, but not huge, not really, in, not really in depth, trying to hit something kind of interesting and unique about Washington, D.C. history. Um, but then uh, writing about Washington, D.C. history, I ran into things like legal questions. So yeah, this law was passed at this point in time. You try and Google that stuff, you don't really get. It's, it's tedious and difficult to find the legislative history and what the law was actually called and when it was passed and when it was signed. So it's like, well, there is a law library at the Library of Congress. And hey, you know what? The Library of Congress is open late in the evening. And it's worth my while to actually go do some real research for these columns rather than just trying to rely upon online. Let's go to real resources, better resources, more detailed resources, um, and find the real information. And maybe even, if I have to, talk to a librarian, you know, <laughs> if I have to, if I have to. Um, so I kept going on, and I wanted to write stories. I wanted to write unique stories. I want, didn't want to repeat what other, all the stuff other people had written. And um, if I did repeat it, I wanted to not rewrite it, but clarify it, make, have a better understanding what happened. So um, that meant going to places like the Manuscripts Division. So uh, again, there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of resources related to Washington, D.C. in the Manuscript Division. And if you want to find you know, what President Wilson thought about something, or Taft, or um, a member of the Commission of Fine Arts, or any of these people, their materials are there at the Library of Congress in the Manuscripts Division. And you know, some of that stuff may be uh, published elsewhere, but there is, there is something really useful about seeing the actual letter. There's, you know, you get, you get something from it. Um, so, of course, as I'm doing this column, I need to illustrate it. So I found, I still use mostly the online uh, prints and photographs catalog. Um, I'm going for that because if I ever decided to turn these, combine these into a book, I don't want to have to do too much copyright research, and I kind of have a big repository of photographs. Lots of material, again, related to Washington, D.C., so let's take advantage of it. Um, and then, again, this is a little bit like what Athena's saying. So I'm starting to dig deeper and deeper and deeper, and there's more and more things at the Library of Congress to make use of to tell interesting stories. So there, you go to the Serials Division, and you find original, you know, you could find original periodicals from the 1890s, 1900s, and some of those are online, uh, but in many cases, you've spent so much time trying to figure out what volume and page and whatever in the Hathi Trust catalog, you might as well have just called it up from the Library of Congress and scanned it yourself. Um, I hit the Rare Books Division a couple times. Uh, again, maps, I obviously use some maps in my stories, and so, um, again, most of those are online. Well, most of the ones I've used are online. Uh, so that I have access to them and can, you know, be writing at midnight and have access to the map. Um, so then you're saying, well, Washington D.C. history—that's fairly, fairly discreet and well-contained. And why do you need to worry about 
why do you need to why do you need to go to the Library of Congress to do research on that? Can't you find stuff elsewhere? Well, um, several answers to that, but topics I have covered. So I've been writing this for about I've done about forty columns, so that's over about four years now, and. So I've covered all different kinds of topics. So I started off with the invention of the paper straw in Washington, D.C. Um, it was invented here. It's, and I try to I repost it every so often now because it's kind of timely because we're talking about plastic straws and paper straws. And originally, originally, before there were, before there were paper straws, what did you use? You used a straw, a real, usually rye, which of course just disintegrated, you know. So you had to, you had to suck your drink down pretty fast, you know. Probably, probably not the best, best thing. So then I moved on to um, lime kilns. So there were lime kilns on Rock Creek in uh, Foggy Bottom, and then Dumbarton House. When they built Dumbarton Bridge, they had to extend Q Street, and there was a house there. No, no one had ever intended Q Street to go through. It didn't. That was not part of anybody's plan, not on any map. So when they decided to extend it, they had to move this house. So, wow, I hadn't read much about the moving of this house. And there's all kinds of resources, that, not just Library of Congress, some like at uh, Department of Consumer Regulatory Affairs that show the actual maps that were used. And in fact, the owner had purchased the house knowing it was gonna have to be moved. He still sued about it, it's DC, so they sued. They sued not wanting to move it. And, also, if sued to get money, so he, you know, compensation for moving it. Um, and then I wrote about underground wires, the YMCA, the history of that, the Albany Penitentiary, because uh, DC would send their prisoners up to Albany. Under, starting with President Lincoln, they were sent up there. DC did not have a penitentiary itself. And Albany had, and Albany had, Albany had the kind of world class penitentiary, so we sent our prisoners up there. Um, and then the Lincoln Monument, which is on Judiciary Square, uh, the police headquarters building across the way, which was part, supposed to be part of a much bigger um, complex called the Municipal Center, which was going to parallel a federal triangle. Um, the Washington Canal noise regulation, because I had worked at DCRA, so I knew a little bit about noise regulation. Uh, airships and zeppelins. So when I did noise regulation, someone, you know, they would do polls. What noises annoy you, you know, to the general public? And um, the last one, one person said deaf mutes, which was kind of like, okay. But right above that was Zeppelins. And I'm like, Zeppelins in Washington in the 1920s. I really don't know anything about that. That sounds fun. So basically it's taking these things that either we know a little bit about or nothing about and just trying to tell the origin story of these things. So Arlington Memorial Bridge, uh, street parking having to do with the green spaces uh, along the street and houses and how far you can build out, not car parking. Um, the, or the introduction of apartment buildings into Washington, D.C. in the 1890s, 1880s, from New York City developers. So um, the creation of Potomac Park, uh, the introduction of zoning based upon ideas from New York City. So there's a continuing theme there. So these are all kinds of things that I wrote about that are Washington, D.C. history. So I've got another 20 or so, which I'm not going to rattle through. But I don't think I could have done a good job covering any of these without making use of the resources of the Library of Congress in a serious, substantive kind of way. Um, like I said, I used all those. I used all those different reading rooms, online resources, um, and I'll step forward on that as well. So, part of how I learned to love the library is I found the right space. So, the science reading room in the Adams Building is the space to do research in the library. So, one, you don't have to check your stuff in. You get to hold on to it all. Um, it's open till 9.30, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's open on Saturdays, regular hours during the other days. Um, so, and there, I forgot to put it in there, you can call up anything from general collections. 
So if it's, if it's in a specialized reading room, you can't get it unless there's a duplicate in the general collections. But in the general collections, you can get anything. So the other day, um, I was finishing a column on smoke pollution in Washington and Teddy Roosevelt in 1905. Okay, there's a story behind that. Um, coming soon. Uh, but then one of the one, so that was partly, it was a very strict law Teddy Roosevelt wanted enforced. He wrote some letters from the press. And one of the things that closed was the ice factory. It's like, ice factory in Washington. I want to know more about that. So I went into the online catalog and I looked up, you know, ice manufacturing and I found some books on ice manufacturing. So I called those books up. So that probably not my next column, but down, down the road. So again, I, you know, there's nowhere else in Washington, except maybe an academic library, where you could do this, where you could have access to this depth of resources. Um, and I think it's important what I do, so I think it's important the, uh, the library be there and be available. Um, I put a note here to, to mention that the library can be intimidating. I mean, that was partly why I hadn't used it before, a few years ago, too much. Walking up to the library, getting past security, which is their, you know, their security, their serious guys. You know, once you get to know them, they get to know you. It's a little, but first off, it's intimidating. And then what reading room do you go to? The checking in of materials for certain reading rooms, so you have to put your stuff away and you can't, like you can't wear a baseball hat and manuscripts and these various kinds of things. Those, those just throw people off. And then actually, okay, you get somewhere. How do I find anything? How do I call for anything? Oh, how do I get a library card? All those kinds of things are just not really transparent. You know, in a public library, it's a little, it's a little bit easier. But the Library of Congress just, uh, and there's reasons for all the rules, there's reasons for all the procedures, well known, but it's just not a really transparent experience when you walk up to, the, when you walk up to it. Even, f even for me as a librarian, and I've used all kinds of libraries, it was just like, well, do I really want to deal with all that? And thinking about all the stuff that's available, I said, yes, I do want to deal with all that. So, so much of the content, there's m m so much online content. And so much of that online content is only available at the Library of Congress itself. I was talking with the people downstairs um, who, in acquisitions, and I said, you know, this, they said, I said, you do online materials too? And they said, yes, we do. And I said, oh. And I said, well, the problem is we don't know what we don't know. That link to uh, lsc.gov pub RR, which lists all these other resources, which gives you links to lists of resources, isn't available on the public web. You have to be inside the library to find it. So you have to know to know how to find it, and then you have to find your way into it and then search it and everything. And I did a, I did a little calculation the other day, and I found that there are about slightly over 1,600 databases, and almost 1,000 of them are available only at the Library of Congress. And I know why, it's copyright and all those reasons. And some other databases are only, only available in the individual reading rooms like Westlaw and others, so we understand that. But if you don't know to even think about it or ask, you know, everything's online. Well, you, you need to go to the Library of Congress and use things there need to be there. So I just wanted to reiterate, like Athena had said, all the different kinds of resources, there's all different kinds of materials. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, for my purposes, you know, I used to work at the public library, so I know about the public library, I know the resources, I know the changes that were made over the past few years, and basically, that means the Library of Congress is the public library for Washington, D.C. So um, I think it is, in many ways, by the general public at least, overlooked, underappreciated, and definitely underused. I've been in there. I've been at reading rooms to myself. I don't exactly mind that. that. That can be fun, but I'd much rather have some other people there with me because I want the hours to stay late. I have to work during the day. I need the late hours so that I can use it. And 
I'm trying to make the case that I have to be there. You can say things are digital, but I have to be there to use them. So you have to be open when I can use you and vice versa. So, um, so it was basically like, use the Library of Congress or lose it. We might lose those late hours. So thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have one more panel member. Please give it up for Mr. Michael Hill, Michael Hill. And after that, we'll do uh, question and answers. Oh, no problem. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much uh, for uh, being here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, as all of us are communicating to you, to talk about an institution and the people who occupy and work at that institution that have helped me and all of us and so many other researchers and, and historians and so forth um, over the years. Um, I myself have been truly fortunate over the last 40 years to do something that I love, historical research and writing. And with that, I've had the good fortune to work with a variety of, of historians, some of whom that you may know, David McCullough, uh, John Meacham, Evan Thomas, Nathaniel Philbrick, and Michael uh, Beschloss. And with that, I've been equally fortunate to have the resources and the people of the Library of Congress to draw upon truly as a partner in that work. It has been for me over the last 40 years, the Library of Congress for me has been the gift that keeps on giving. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'd like to give you some examples uh, and talk a little bit about uh, some of the people that I've gotten to know and the resources and assistance that, that this institution can give to professional writers, historians, or just people who are just curious about life and history and how the Library of Congress and its resources and people can be partners. The first example is I was, I was helping out David McCullough do a book called The Greater Journey about Americans in Paris in the 19th century. And the, the book is all set through the eyes and, and, and words of, of, of Americans as they traveled through Paris throughout the century. And when he got to the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, he said, how are we going to tell this through an American's eyes? and so forth because everybody probably left. So he said, find out who the uh, diplomat was there. So I, I went and found out that a fellow by the name of Elihu Washburn was our minister, the equivalent of the ambassador to France at that time. So lo and behold, I found out that his collection of papers were at the manuscript reading room. So at that point, I hightailed it up and met with Jeff Flannery, the head of the manuscript reading room. and. The, Athena and I were talking beforehand is that it's, it's this wonderful thing that whenever either of us, and I'm sure other people, undertake a project, the first thing you do is you go up and see Jeff Flannery and ask what he has or what suggestions he has. He's been an amazing resource and friend um, for probably over 30 years. At any rate, so I went up to look at the Elihu Washburn collection, and lo and behold, what we found was a treasure trove of his original letters and correspondence, both personal and diplomatic, that he was writing from Paris during the, the outbreak of the war and the siege in the Commune. And the thing that made it so extraordinary is that virtually every other diplomat left when the war broke out, and he was one of the few to stay uh, to protect uh, some Americans who did stay, but also to help to pr protect some of the Germans and the Parisians and so forth. Not only did we find his letters and correspondence, but interspersed as we started going through, we found that he kept a diary and a journal talking about his personal experiences and what he was going through on a day-to-day -day basis. That material formed one chapter in David's Greater Journey book. And then as a spin-off of that, Simon & Schuster decided to publish the entire diary and letters that we found there, which um, I co-authored and David was kind enough to do a forward to. Also tied, and this deals with another division of the Library of Congress's newspaper reading room, which is an incredible resource. And when he was doing the Greater Journey book, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the tools that, that um, 
historians and biographers and so, uh, so forth um, use is, of course, newspapers because it can provide you with eyewitness accounts, but also those little details or color that you might not be able to find anywhere else. So we wanted to try and find a newspaper that could help us find out what was happening in Paris at the time. So I went and talked to um, one of the archivists at the newspaper reading room, and they said, well, we have this newspaper called Galignani's Messenger, which was an English newspaper published in Paris in the 19th and early 20th century, which was in English, and it was provided for English travelers or Americans who might be coming through who didn't speak French or read French or whatever. And it was an absolute gold mine, which provided so many details and little rich moments throughout that greater uh, journeys book, and I asked the archivist that I was talking to one point, I said, how many people d have ever used this Galignani's messenger before? And he said, I don't know, I've been here for 30 years and nobody's ever used it prior to this time. So it shows you those little jewels and, and, and elements of gold that are they're buried as everybody else has talked to in the Library of Congress. You just have to be there to find them. Um, another example of how, how an archivist can be a partner in the process, in the writing process or the creative process. Um, and this also is another lesson that I have learned very early on is that a lot of people will come into the Library of Congress and not want to talk about what they're, they're working on. They feel a sense of proprietary about it. Um, David McCullough and other historians have always said, tell everybody what you're working on. Perfect example was that I was helping Evan Thomas do a book about Bobby Kennedy, and I was up in the manuscript reading room talking to Jeff Flannery one time and, and telling him about the book, and he said, well, have you looked at the John Bartlow Martin papers? And I said, what? I, I don't know anything about it. He goes, well, there's a campaign diary in there that he kept during the 68 campaign from the beginning all the way through Bobby Kennedy's assassination. And I said, I didn't know anything about it. So, of course, I pulled it right away, Xeroxed it off. It was extraordinary. And it had, it had, it's, as far as I was able to determine, the only inside the campaign diary that's ever come to light that was ever done of the Bobby Kennedy campaign. And Evan was able to use some nice little elements from that for his book. Another quick example about Again, how the archivists and the curators can be partners in your process. I was helping John Meacham do a book about, one of his early books about uh, Franklin Roosevelt and uh, Winston Churchill. And um, we found out that Pamela Harriman's papers were at the Library of Congress, but they had been unprocessed. So we were able to negotiate very specifically um, through the curator there to uh, uh, to uh, process a specific portion of the collection of Pamela Harriman's letters that she wrote during World War II. And that's an example where, again, the, the curators and the archivists, if you're, if you're serious and you really want to uh, try and do it, that they will do whatever they can within the rules and so forth to try and help you. And, um, and John, I know, used some examples uh, of that uh, from there. Just three other uh, quick examples of other divisions. Um, uh, Athena talked a little bit about prints and photographs, which is extraordinary. And anytime I work on a project and it gets to illustrations, um, uh, and they say, well, what, what should we do? First thing I always say is go to the Library of Congress, prints and photographs, digital collection online. Um, it's extraordinary what they've, what they've uh, produced up there, first of all. Secondly, the quality is ter terrific. And thirdly, is that it doesn't cost you a penny. And a lot of people make the mistake, and I've stumbled across people do that, make the mistake that they go to Corbis or Getty or one of the other houses, and they pay $200, $250 for an image that if you had gone to the Library of Congress and seen it there, you can get either that image or a similar image and download it directly, high quality, publishable quality. Maps, geography and maps is another perfect example. And um, the collection that they have there is extraordinary. Um, and the people there are extraordinary. Uh, David McCullough's 1776 book, there's several maps there of, of Boston during the, um, the revolutionary period, and I believe of the New York campaigns that were actually reproduced from their digital collection online that made it into the book. And the, the last is um, 
the, the Performing Arts Music Division, which again is extraordinary. And one of the things I love is walking into that reading room, and one of the first things, I assume it's still there, that you see off to the left is Sergei uh, Rachmaninoff's desk that he used when he was doing his work. And every time I see that, it just, it, it, I, I just get goose pimples because it's unbelievable to think that that desk is there. And there was one project I was working on with David McCullough's daughter. She was doing a wonderful book about letters of great Americans to their children. And I went through the Leonard Bernstein collection and found some very cute little notes that he was writing to his children, which were, which were wonderful. Um, and the last thing I'd like to, ref uh, to refer to is the great, wonderful main reading room in the Jefferson Building. It's one of the most extraordinary wonders in the world, and I've been doing this research for almost 40 years, and every time I go in there, I consider myself how lucky I am to do what I do and to have this place to go to to do what I do. And um, so I encourage all of you, even if you're just interested or if you're working on a book, take advantage of this wonderful re resource and the wonderful people that are there. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, time flies when, when you're having fun. Um, and I, I saw the wrap up sign come up. So, but um, if you have any questions for us, any questions for us, please, please come up and, and speak to us. We're here, we like pictures or anything like that. But um, I see someone is to the mic, so we'll take a, a, a quick question, if that's okay. Very, very brief comment oh, wait, hold only. Hold on, my friend, hold on. Uh, oh, no, I, <laughs> I see. If you can go to the mic so then everybody can hear you be the second question, and then we can go ahead and mount. Thank you, my so, friend. Those were wonderful talks, very inspiring for low-level users like me, but I have to make one correction. The columnist of the internal said it is kind of you know, deteriorating or you know, uh, uh, reprehensible if you want to get a reader's card. Getting a reader's card is extremely simple. You need to be 16 years old. You have to have a government-issued picture ID. If you are not a U.S. citizen, you can take any passport, and it takes few minutes, you can pre-register online, so don't let that be a deterrent to you. If you want to access the biggest cookbook collection in the world because you have a special dinner, go there. <laughs> and you can get a card in the Madison building, if I'm not mistaken, you get a reader's card in the Madison building. And the Jefferson also, thank you very much, thank you very much. All right, my friend, it's on you, sir. Hello, okay. Um, I, right now, I've got a scar that's still there from a police dog, and I was at the Law Library of Congress during the magazine article, you know, using whatever computer that was, and uh, you know, what first article, I put in police dogs, and it was like, no hits, you know, try something else. It was, it was obvious it had been hacked to keep people from, to do research, say, for police dog bites, that kind of stuff. Um, and I guess what I'm saying is, do you have any recommendations for, um, like rogue elements within the LOC that, you know, oh, this is an example. Why aren't there any kind of like, uh, at the main reading room across from it, you know, that computer room, why aren't there any like guards for people, you know, using the internet, you know, like if you want to call it that, like screens to keep people from like eyeballing your passwords to your email and various websites, you know, so it's, it's, okay, it's, well, an, identity, it's an identity thief's dream, you know, the, the computer lab across in the main reading room, so. Okay, uh, that, that is a, a question that I honestly couldldn't answer. Okay. I wouldn't even attempt to okay. uh, represent the Library of Congress in, in that fashion. Um, but that sounds like a concern that you have now. Yes, it is. So we're do, open. Do you have anyone else I can ask them? Any recommendations? I, I sure can, but I, if you don't mind, can I speak to you on the side about that? It's, if that's okay? I, I'll absolutely. definitely give you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That, thank you, thank you. I'll definitely give you that one on one attention, sir. Make sure we get that answer for you, okay? All right, I appreciate you, I appreciate you, all right. Um, anyone else? Anyone else? Bueller? <laughs> Bueller. Oh, I saw one more hand, one more hand and we'll be gone. Um, and while she's working her way to the mic, again, I'm with the Copyright Office, we can find it's copyright.gov, 202-707-3000, and our last question or comment for the evening. How are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm fine, I'm fine. So my daughter participated in History Day, National History Day, when she was in high school. And I was just wondering, I was just thinking this would have been a great talk for her to hear before she did all that. And um, do you have kids um, who, in that National History Day competition that, that, uh, asked, that come to seek your resources? 
See, this is family. I love it. Someone said, oh, I, I, I have someone. Can, can you, you speak up a little bit if you don't mind? If you don't mind? Okay. Almost 20 years ago um, now she said it, it, it was happening. So again, if, if you just step off to the side and I'll, I'll make sure I can get that answer for you. All right. All right. Definitely. Cool. Cool. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, please give it up for the panel. Please give it up for our interpreters. And uh, especially um, you, you didn't hear my poem before and I saw your fingers really moving, really moving. So I thank you very, very much. All right. Any questions? Just come on up and talk to us. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.